Good evening, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to our partners in JCC and our producer behind the scenes, Jared Goldberg, and of course to Dan Schulman for taking the time to join us. To give you a brief introduction of Dan, he's a longtime friend of Maccabi Canada, an award-winning Canadian sportscaster for both ESPN and Sportsnet. American audiences first began hearing Dan's voice on ESPN in 1995. Over the past 25 years, he served as the main play-by-play -play voice for Sunday Night Baseball, as well as a commentator for NCAA men's college basketball. Closer to home, Dan is the play-by-play -play commentator for Sportsnet's coverage of the Blue Jays. In recognition of his illustrious career, Dan became the first two-time winner of the Sports Media Canadian Broadcaster of the Year Award, 2000 and 2007, and was named the National Sportscaster of the Year in 2011 by the National Sports Media Association. Outside of the broadcast booth, Dan is also a two-time veteran of the Maccabee Games, playing on Canada's Masters basketball team in 2013 and 2017. He also represented Canada at the 2011 Pan American Games in Brazil, winning a silver medal. Dan, welcome. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's uh, good to be with you and uh, hope you're doing okay, your family's okay. And, and before we forget, before we go any further, uh, if it weren't for Jared, we wouldn't we wouldn't be bringing you this right now. So, I, you know, Jared Goldberg, the producer behind the scenes, is the star of the show. Then again, if anything goes wrong, we can blame him later on. But but he is the star of the show right now. Perfectly said. So, Dan, firstly, how are you and your family doing? Uh, everybody is doing well. Thank you. Um, you know, I think like a lot of people, I'm uh, not really working much right now. So uh, I've been home a lot. Um, and spending time with family. I've got four kids, uh, three older kids from my first marriage and a little one from my second marriage. And uh, my two oldest boys uh, aren't in Toronto right now. One is in Halifax, one is in Montreal. So I haven't had a chance to see them in a long time, but texting and FaceTiming and talking and all that. And uh, I'm doing, uh, spending lots of time with my wife and son, uh, a lot of dog walks. My dog is the big winner of, of the pandemic. She's got more daddy time than she's ever had. Uh, my parents live nearby, so, you know, helping them with groceries, making sure they're okay. They come over every now and again, and we do a distance walk around the neighborhood where I live. So, listen, thankfully, everybody is healthy. Uh, everybody is safe right now, and, and hopefully day by day we'll, we'll get back to whatever a new normal is, but hopefully we'll get back to closer to, to a normal style of life, uh, hopefully in the next, if not weeks, couple of months maybe. Of course, of course. You can tell your son in Montreal that St. Vader Bagel is open for takeout. Okay, uh, I, I will let him know that. So I just read an incredible bio. Uh, you've accomplished so much. Let's go back to the beginning. What first propelled you into sports broadcasting? How did you get started? Well, that's a, a long story, and I don't want to bore people to tears, so I'll tell it as quickly as I can. But uh, I went to Western University, what at the time it was known as the University of Western Ontario. I still prefer to call it University of Western Ontario. And uh, I was a math kid. I was an actuary. Uh, I majored in actuarial science. But when I was at Western, my parents had always kind of um, impressed upon my sisters and me to get involved, not just to go to class, to do something outside class at school. And I love sports, so I wanted to write for the newspaper at Western, the Western Gazette, terrific paper. But there was a lineup of like 50 or 60 kids the first day of Frosh Week. And I got a little impatient and gave up and started walking back towards my dorm. And before I left the main campus building, there was a, a door that just said Radio Western across it. That's it. And I knocked on the door and went in and said, hey, is this the campus radio station? And they said, yeah. And I said, do you do sports? And they said, yeah. And I said, do you need any volunteers? And they said, yeah. And a week later, I was helping out on a Western Windsor football game. And for four years when I was there, I broadcast basketball games, football games, had a talk show, never really thought about getting into it as a career, graduated with a degree in actuarial science, worked for a few months as an actuary. And then, as I like to say, I had my midlife crisis at the age of 22. I, I just didn't feel it was for me. And I made a deal with my parents who are watching right now. So I have to get this story right. I made a deal with my parents that uh, give me two years. Let me, give me two years to see if I could make it in radio. I had kept some old cassette tapes from Western and I sent it out to a bunch of radio stations, got a ton of no's, only got one yes at a radio station in Barrie, CKBB, which isn't even known by that name anymore, and started working part time at CKBB. Eventually, uh, through a connection, a friend of a friend of a friend, met somebody at CJCL, which is now the fan. Um, got a chance to work part time at the fan while I was working up in Barrie. And uh, over many years, one thing led to another. But, um, you know, I, I didn't intend to get into this. I kind of fell into it 
sideways and and uh, I'm very fortunate that it's gone as well as it has. Fantastic. So now we know you for Sunday Night Baseball. As a proud Canadian and Torontonian, you must have grown up on hockey. Yes. Uh, so you've gone to baseball and basketball. So why those sports and uh, why specifically baseball? Um, well, when I was a kid, hockey was my favorite sport. I'm old enough, never mind no Raptors. I can remember years before the Blue Jays. I was 10 years old when the Blue Jays came in. Uh, and hockey was by far my number one sport. And uh, until my last day on earth, my favorite athlete will be Daryl Sittler. Uh, like, there's no doubt about it. Um, meeting Daryl Sittler is about the most nervous I've ever been in my life the first time I interviewed him when I was at the fan. Uh, the reason I wound up in baseball and basketball is kind of that those are where the opportunities uh, presented themselves. When, when I was at the fan in 1992, three, um, Tom Cheek, Jerry Howarth, of course, were the radio broadcasters for the Blue Jays, and I started. Uh, cutting my teeth on the pre and post game shows, doing some uh, Jays talk and some of the pre. Scott Ferguson and I would rotate around doing pre and post game shows, and and I was always a huge basketball fan. Uh, this is before the Raptors again. So if there was anything to be talked about on the radio station about basketball, I was kind of the guy to do it. And and not that I was an expert or anything, but nobody else really followed basketball. And I loved, always loved basketball. My dad was a really good player. I was a mediocre player, but I just loved basketball. So. Actually, in 1994, they held the World Championships of Basketball in Toronto. Dream Team 2 was the U.S. team. Uh, I was young. I was only like 27 years old. And I wound up doing those games on CTV because, again, there just weren't basketball people around in Canada at the time. So, like, I loved hockey. I loved football. But the opportunities presented themselves in basketball uh, and baseball. Jim Hewson, who's the great voice of Hockey Night in Canada, was the Blue Jay voice for a number of years in addition to hockey. And at one point, he decided uh, that he wanted to move back to Vancouver and just focus on hockey. So the Blue Jay job became available in 1995. I applied for it. I didn't get the job. Three months later, I got a phone call saying, are you still interested? And I said, sure. So I don't know who they offered it to uh, at the beginning. This is TSN had the Blue Jay rights that I was doing then. Eventually got the Blue Jay job. Uh, I had been doing a little bit of work for ESPN Radio. They knew of me. Somebody got sick, so ESPN, knowing I was a baseball guy and knowing me from radio, they asked me to fill in on a baseball game, so I did that for them. And then they said, oh, good job. Like We'll keep you in mind. Send us a demo tape of what you have. And I didn't have a demo tape, but I put one together, and I put that basketball from the World Championships that had been in Toronto the previous year, sent it down to ESPN, and literally a month later, I was doing college basketball games for ESPN. So you know, just as easily the opera, I, I actually did some hockey back in the day for TSN uh, and actually did hockey at an Olympics in Lillehammer in 1994, which only friends and family, not even friends and family, only immediate family probably remember. But basically, Daniel, the reason is uh, baseball and basketball were, those were the doors that opened to me. Otherwise, I could just as easily have wound up as a football hockey guy. Wow. Uh, that's quite the journey. And uh, you know what? Uh, the Blue Jays job, you missed the two glory years. So uh, all well that ends well. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was there, as I said, in, in, as the, the pre and post game show guy. And I was so young. I was 25, 26 years old during those years. Um, I graduated from Western in 1989. And in 1992, I was sitting in the booth with Tom and Jerry as the Blue Jays were winning playoff games. Like it was, it was just crazy to me that, that I was in that kind of situation because I was so new and there was so much that I didn't know. And all of a sudden, like I'm at, it was Sky Dome then. I'm at Sky Dome or I'm interviewing players on the field. Or like Tom and Jerry were meeting them was a huge deal to me. I had grown up listening to them, uh, you know, as a kid. Uh, Tom, right from the very beginning, Jerry came in a number of years later. So, you know, being a Toronto kid and just trying to make it in this industry because it was something that I wanted to do. It felt like a long shot. Uh, and maybe I was too naive to know how long the odds were, but it, it's I, I was very, very fortunate and, you know, to to be at Maple Leaf games or to be at Blue Jay games or to be at Raptor games or college basketball games or Sunday night baseball or whatever it is, uh, I feel very fortunate. So you've called to work with some of the best ball players, uh, some of the uh, baseball, basketball, even hockey. Who was the best interview? Who was the most memorable? The most memorable interview. So I'm, I'm a play-by-play -play guy more than an interviewer. Um, but in, in terms of interviews I, I've done, I'll tell you one guy that stands out. I only interviewed him once in my life, I think. 
But when I got a chance to interview Hank Aaron, that was that was something pretty special to me. I mean, I'm a I'm a huge fan of baseball. Obviously, I'm a fan of the history of the sport. I was always a huge fan of Hank Aaron, and getting a chance to interview him was something. I mentioned Daryl Sittler, so you know, getting a chance first couple of times to interview Daryl Sittler back when I was doing a talk show, back when I was on the fan back in the '90s, um, that was really cool. And then, as you mentioned, I've I've had a chance to work with a lot of really wonderful people uh, as my color commentators over the years. Um, and, you know, for, for baseball at ESPN, whether it's Aaron Boone or Oral Hershiser or Terry Francona or Joe Morgan or the late Tony Gwynn, I, Tony Gwynn. And I know a lot of people in Canada never saw any of this stuff because um, it's hard to find it on in Canada and it was harder then. But Tony Gwynn was my broadcast partner for a couple of years. David Justice was my broadcast partner for years. So that's been great. Um, and then college basketball for ESPN. I've worked with both Dick Vitale and Jay Billis hundreds and hundreds of times, and they're both wonderful. And, and you know, if you go back into the Wayback Machine, again, nobody uh, other than me probably remembers this, but back in the old, old, old days, the first couple of Raptor years when when I was still with TSN, I did some Raptor games and, and worked with Leo Routens a lot, and Leo and I are good friends to this day, and, and I loved working with him. So it, it's, it's kind of fun when, you know, people you watched on TV playing their sports professionally – a few years later, become your friends. It, it's another thing that you don't you don't expect to happen uh, when you're an actuarial science major at Western. But uh, but it's it's been wonderful. That's incredible. Uh, for everyone watching at home, please ask questions on Facebook Live or if you're on the virtual JCC website, you can type your questions in the uh, chat box and uh, we'll get to them as they come in. First question comes in from Jordan. Uh, what has been the professional highlight of your career? That's a good question. It's a hard answer. Again, I've been very lucky, but uh, I think the thing that I hold nearest and dearest to my heart, um, again, having worked for ESPN as I have for, for as many years as I have, ESPN does not have the television rights for the World Series. You see Joe Buck on Fox doing the World Series for many, many years, spectacular broadcaster. Uh, ESPN radio has the rights for all of the major league baseball playoffs. And I've been lucky to do the MLB playoffs for about the last 20 years. And I've done the last nine world series. And I think doing that, um, you know, all broadcast, all game play by play guys want to do championships. Um, and, and having a chance to do the last nine world series is probably the highlight of my career. Uh, the first one I did was St. Louis and Texas, which may not be that memorable to, the casual fan, but game six of that series is as famous and crazy and legendary a game as there's ever been. David Fries tripled in the ninth to tie it, homered in the 11th to win it, and the Cardinals went on to win the next night of game seven. So I'd say the World Series on ESPN Radio. On the college basketball side, I've been so lucky. And again, I know a lot of people uh, in Canada aren't, aren't big college basketball fans, but I've been very lucky the last 12 or 13 years, however many years it is to do uh, the Duke North Carolina games every single year, and there is nothing, nothing uh, like doing Duke North Carolina games. I know. I think I've got a couple of buddies who are on the uh, on the webinar tonight, and and they've been to those games with me, and and know how fun they are. And then again, way back, um, you know, I mentioned I did hockey at the Olympics, and I was the B guy. I didn't do the Canada games. I would do Norway, Russia, or Finland, uh, Sweden, who whatever the case may be. But to go to an Olympics and do hockey and then to do a little bit of NHL hockey for TSN before I kind of got into basketball full time was just as exciting, too, because, you know, as we mentioned, I was a, an enormous uh, hockey fan as a kid. So hard to pick just one. That's awesome. So we're getting uh, well, first from uh, Steve Indig, which I think might be a buddy <laughs> of yours, I wants to know about your jump shot. Uh, Steve Indig is not a buddy of mine. So uh, yes, he is. Steve Indig is, um, is a good friend of mine and we play basketball together. He's not a very nice person, but his family's really nice. So we, and we have some mutual friends. So as, as Steve will tell you, my jump shot comes and goes. So <laughs> I don't know that it's gotten any better, but, uh, Steve, you'll be happy. Well, I saw Steve a couple of weeks ago, so he knows this. Uh, I've actually lost 10 pounds in isolation. So I know you're supposed to gain weight. But I'm supervised by my wife now, so I'm eating much better. I'm down 10 pounds. So uh, I, I hope that the next time Steve and I are on the court together, I can't keep up with him. He's way too quick. He's way too quick for me. But maybe I can foul him a little less noticeably when we get back out on the court. 
uh, as long as you make sure you're in perfect game shape for the uh, 2022 Maccabee games. <laughs> we'll see. Well, <laughs> I think that question's coming later from somebody else, but uh, I, I, you have to tell the backstory if you're going to ask that. Well, you kind of did. So, but yeah, we'll see. I, I'm keeping the door open, but I'm not getting any younger. And, you know, the pandemic delaying the, the games another year is not really helping me at all. But so we'll see what happens. We'll touch on the Maccabee in a few minutes, but we're getting a lot of questions about uh, sports as it stands now and uh, whether the NHL season, the NBA season is going to continue. And of course, what's going to happen with baseball? So if you can touch on that. Yeah, it's it's a good question and it's a great unknown. I'm, I'm more familiar with the, the possibilities for baseball than the NHL or the NBA because that's what I hope to be working on in the summer. Uh, but there are just so many unknowns. Um, if you're going to do this, you have to have testing available for all of the athletes and the staff on each team. And can you do that if testing is not widely available throughout the United States and possibly Canada, if there are some games played in Canada? It's just, it's a, it's a bad look. Um, you know, if the virus is still going strong, if there's a second wave, if every test is needed for healthcare workers or just the general public, how does it look um, if some of those tests are going to baseball players or basketball players. Now, if it's being done privately and they're paying for them, then maybe that's something that, you know, that's some way that it can work a little bit better. But take, for example, baseball. Let's say there's a plan, where, and I, there have been a number of different plans, but uh, let's say there's one where half the teams are in Arizona, half the teams are in Florida, which has been mentioned. Um, so now in, so the Blue Jays have their facility in Dunedin, Florida. So you'd have the players there plus the coaches and the staff. I don't know if the broadcasters would be there or not, or if we'd be calling games off a monitor from the, the Sportsnet studio in Toronto. But that aside, you know, those 50, 60, 70 people who are in the Blue Jays party are basically in quarantine. And they can only be at the hotel and the ballpark. So then now the ballpark staff and the hotel staff, are they in quarantine also? And what about their families? And will the ballplayers be willing to leave their families for three, four, five months to go play baseball or basketball. I, I don't know. Like there are just so many unknowns about this. So, um, you know, the latest plan for baseball said that everybody would be using their home ballpark. But uh, since we're all here in Canada right now, if there are still border restrictions and people have to quarantine for two weeks when they come from the US or anywhere, the Blue Jays can't play here because the other teams wouldn't be able to come. So then the Blue Jays might be the only team that doesn't play at home. There are just so many unknowns. Uh, I think there will be baseball. I think at some point in July, there will be baseball. The season will go into October, and maybe the World Series happens in November instead of October. NHL, NBA, I'm not as familiar with. I think they're both going to try, uh, try like hell to make it happen. And if they can, that'll set back next year. They'd have to delay the start of next season because this season would run so late. So, But you know what? There's a lot of money behind it. And I do think if you can make it work, there's real value uh, from a mental health perspective with so many people sitting at home and so many people, you know, struggling in one way or another, maybe don't have a job to go back to. For, for all of us who are sports fans, you put a baseball game on during the day and you put a basketball game on at night and that's going to cheer some people up. And I don't think that should be taken lightly, but there are a lot of hurdles that have to be overcome before this can happen. Of course, of course. You have, uh, well, Again, to a college basketball question right here from John. Uh, how has it been following Zion while he was going through his crazy draft year? Uh, it was crazy. And, and I was very fortunate. Uh, again, I do a lot of Duke games for North Car uh, for uh, ESPN. And the, the Zion's year, I think I did 12 of his 30-whatever games that he played in. And uh, actually, even before that, they did a tour in Toronto and Montreal in August. They played U of T, Ryerson, and I think it was Concordia, I believe, that they played. Um, and uh, no, they didn't play Ryerson. I'm sorry. They played U of T. I'm going to forget. They did not play Ryerson. They played two games in Toronto, and they played one game in Montreal. That I know. Um, no, they did play Ryerson. They didn't play Carlton. They played U of T, Ryerson, I think, Concordia. So I did those games in August and then had a chance to do a bunch of his games during the regular season. And honestly, it was like being like on a, a, a tour of a, of a rock band. It was like the Beatles. Uh, it was really crazy. You know, R.J. Barrett was a huge deal, and Zion Williamson just even dwarfed that um, because he was so incredible and so popular and the big smile and all the dunks. And, you know, we've never seen a guy that size have that type and, and level of athleticism. 
So, you know, but getting back to the question before, when I was asked about, you know, what's a highlight, uh, when you work for a national network like ESPN, you don't take sides. I don't care if Duke wins or Virginia wins. I don't care if Kansas wins or, or Missouri wins. But getting a chance, I won't lie, getting a chance to do all those Zion Williamson games was was pretty cool. And and this does, not that this really affects me, but the ratings were off the chart. Like the, the number of people in the U.S. watching the games that year were just absolutely insane. Um, and it was, you know, you know, when you know twice as many people are out there watching a game as would normally be the case, you get a little more fired up as well. Of course. So, you know, just touching on college basketball, how do you think the fact that uh, March was not the same without March Madness? Yeah. You know, what, what were your thoughts when it was canceled? How will it affect the athletes going forward or this year? Well, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, doing the ACC tournament when it was canceled. Um, basketball was canceled in the middle of what we call championship week when all the conference tournaments take place. So uh, it was actually kind of a bizarre scene. We were supposed to do a game starting at noon between Florida State and Clemson, and the two teams came out on the floor and started warming up, and the bands were there. And they were, they were you know, having a kind of a contest, playing their fight song one against the other. There were very few people in the stands because the day before the edict had come down, nobody in the stands. I think they gave each school 75 tickets for family or something like that. But this is a 20,000 seat arena and there were maybe 200 people in the arena. So it was kind of a surreal experience. Um, and then about 20 minutes before the game, they canceled the game. One by one conference tournaments around the country started being canceled. And we kind of knew eventually that the ACC tournament would be canceled as well. And, and back then, you know, we know so much more now. There were only a few dozen cases here and there. And I think most of us, or many of us, knew that this was serious and was going to get much more serious. But back then, and I wasn't one of them, a lot of people thought it was crazy and drastic to do what was done. You know, as we've seen, unfortunately, with all the, uh, you know, all the people who have become infected and, and sadly, all of those who have passed away, this was not something to be taken lightly in, in any way. Uh, but you feel for the athletes, you feel for the seniors, especially the basketball players whose careers ended on that day. If you were a, a college baseball player or a college lacrosse player, those are spring sports. Those athletes are being given an extra year of eligibility. If you played a winter sport like college basketball, you're done if you're a senior. So uh, you feel for them. The, the, there are no winners here. You know, um, I mean, I've got kids and each of them is being impacted in different ways by this. Uh, you feel for professional athletes, college student athletes, uh, and, and everybody um, who's going through this. It's uh, Everybody is suffering in, in one way or another, I've got to believe, and, and hopefully everybody you know comes out of this uh, trying to find a positive out of this huge negative. Of course. You, you mentioned, you touched on the NCAA giving an extra year of eligibility to certain athletes. A big piece of news that came out this year from the NCAA is that they're allowing athletes, certain athletes, to profit from their names, image, and likenesses. How do you think this will affect athletes? How will it affect the game? Uh, I think it's fair. I think it's fine. Like if you are, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. If you're a, a very talented musician and you're in uh, at university on a music scholarship, you can earn money on the side. If you're an actor, a singer, a dancer, a YouTube sensation, there are no rules saying you can't earn money on the side. So why should a, why should an athlete be subject to that? So right now, the ruling that's come out recently, the one you're referring to, is called, it's about name, image, and likeness. And it, it means that the student athletes can go to an autograph show. They can do endorsements outside of school. It's not like it's now above board for colleges to pay a player to go play there. But I think we're headed in that direction. And it might take five, 10 years. I think we're headed in that direction. Uh, where the, all that's above board, but they, they are allowed to go out on the side and earn extra income based on who they are. And, and uh, I think it's fine. It, it won't impact that many people. You know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of U.S. student athletes. Uh, and there are probably a few hundred who might be able to make some money off that. And the vast majority of them are football and basketball players. But I, I think it's totally fair. Do you think they should get paid? By the schools? By the schools or? Yeah. Well, outside in terms of earning endorsements, like we, like I was just saying, I think that's totally fine. Same as an actor, singer, dancer, what, what a musician, whatever. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little fuzzier on the should schools pay them. I know a lot of people say absolutely they should. 
Uh, I still think there's value in like giving a kid a scholarship and coaching and training and room and board and some expenses like that's not nothing that 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 is something i'd like to see a little bit more put in there there's some silly rules about uh you know flying home flying your family out meal money this kind of thing i, I we don't want these kids to be to be starving here so i'd like to see uh without question an upgrade in uh in some of the benefits that can come to them whether it's just out and out capitalism and somebody could say to Zion Williamson, we'll pay you 250000 to come to our school. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I, I might throw that back to Steve Indick at some point. He's a, he's a <laughs> lawyer, and, and, and he claims to be smarter than me, so maybe we can get him up here for a future chat at Maccabi, and he can answer that question. It would be a pleasure. <laughs> uh, one final college basketball question, because we're talking about Zion. We're talking about these elite athletes, the ones that could profit from their likeness. The college basketball one and done rule. What are your thoughts? Um, not a fan of the rule. So again, uh, if you're 18 years old and you're a hockey player, you can get drafted. You know, Sidney Crosby gets drafted right out of high school, right out of junior, and he can go play in the NHL when he's 18. Ken Griffey Jr. gets drafted out of high school and he can go play in the majors if he's good enough. I think it should be the same for basketball. I don't see why it should be treated differently. I don't like the one and done rule for a couple of reasons. Uh, it, it, in my mind, it leads to a, to chaos. May be strong, but a lot of uh, uncertainty in college basketball. Are guys staying? Are they going? Do we need to recruit in case he leaves? Not. It, it, you know, I, I'm. Everybody likes uh, things the way they were when they were young. And when I was young, guys stayed four years. I realize that's not going to happen that we've gone through that, you know, the horse is out of the barn uh, on that. But I do think players should be able to go right out of high school. But if they don't go right out of high school, the baseball rule, for example, is if you don't go right out of high school, you can't go back in the draft for three years. Maybe they can do something like that. I don't know. Like if the top 150 kids go to try to go pro right out of high school, in my mind, it's really going to hurt college basketball. But how many kids are going to go? There are only two rounds in the draft. Only 60 guys get drafted. What I worry about as a guy who loves college basketball and works on college basketball is that the NBA is going to figure out a way to make this work for them. The NBA and the NCAA are not partners right now. And I think both would benefit if they were. But maybe the NBA will set up another league, like a younger development league under the G League for 18, 19, 20-year-olds, that sort of thing. And you can come right out of high school. We'll draft you. And we'll stick you in that development league, that younger league for a year or two until you're ready to go to the NBA. And it'll be more appealing uh, for a lot of these kids. Not every, like I love education and I love college basketball. Not everybody's meant to go to college. Not everybody should be forced to go to college. If the NBA is your dream and the rules allow you to go, go. Um, so I, I'm conflicted because my heart's in one place. Um, but I also think like if I had an 18-year-old kid who was a surefire lottery pick, I don't know if, uh, you know, there are great benefits to college, but I can understand why that kid want, might want to go pro. And we're starting to see it. There are a couple of kids this year who were supposed to go to college. They've changed their minds, and now they're part of this new G League development mm -hmm. program. And it's two or three kids this year, and I think it'll be four or five next year. And I think it'll keep climbing unless the NCAA figures out a way to incentivize these kids to come to college. Yeah, very fair. So let's get back to... Uh, why we're all here tonight, and it's uh, Maccabi Canada, the Maccabee Games. Dan, you're a two-time competitor at the Maccabee Games, and as I said, I'm hoping for a third appearance in 2022. <laughs> Talk to us about the experience, about the games, being in Israel, and uh, playing for Team Canada. Yeah, so it was, well, let me say this first. I am not a great basketball player, and I mean that sincerely. <laughs> um, the, the guys on the team let me play for a couple of reasons. One is the first time that I played, uh, was at the Pan Am Games in Brazil. And back then, I fly a ton for work, and I had like the highest status you can have for Air Canada. And I was able to upgrade three of my teammates from coach to business class on the flight down to Sao Paulo. That's the reason they let me on the team in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we were at Hoop Dome, and there were like eight of them having a shooting competition that, I would, that we were judging, and the three guys who won it got upgraded into business class. Um, 
I met these guys. Actually, I got asked by JNF many years ago, probably 2009 or 10, uh, if I would help out with a charity basketball tournament. So I got together with some old Benet Brith buddies and some old Western buddies, and we put together a team. And we lost in the final to this group of guys who were good, really good. Um, and that was the end of it. And then a month later, Tommy Batcher, who may or may not be on this, I'm not sure. Tommy Batcher, I don't know his exact title, but he's he's the he's the man. He's the at, president. He's, he's the, the president man. of Maccabi. He's the president of Maccabi. And Tommy Batcher called me like a month later. I didn't know Tommy. And he said, hey, um, would you be in, interested in helping us raise some money for, for uh, Maccabi Canada? And I said, sure. So I came in and we had a meeting, me, Tommy, and one other guy. And the one other guy who I believe is listening tonight, his name is Alex Brainus. And I walked into the room and I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, or I said, like, didn't we just play basketball against each other last month at Hoop Dome and the JNF thing? And, and um, so we met and he said, why don't you come out and have a run with us? So I went out a, a week or two later, whatever, and, and, and we play. It was just pickup or something like that. And Alex um, and I, I wasn't even like totally clear that this was the Masters basketball team. Uh, invited me to be on the team. And, and it's been wonderful. Again, I'm not a great player. I have five fouls, two sharp elbows, and that's that's what I'm there to do. Um, I'm, I'm there to get the odd rebound and and uh, let the guards take shots. So, but, uh, you know, I've made some great friendships out of this. Went down to Brazil, as you mentioned, in 2011. Went to Israel for the first time, and I love going to Israel. Um, I've been to Israel four times in my life, twice with Maccabi. Um, in 2013, unfortunately, I broke my foot right at the beginning of our first game. Um, so I, I was going to stop playing after 2013, but because I broke my foot, I wanted to go back one more time. So I went back in 2017, which was my favorite experience of the three. Um, I didn't get badly hurt. I got a little bit hurt. I, I always get a little bit hurt, but I didn't get badly hurt. And we just, we had a great time, um, you know, for those on the Maccabi side, you know, you guys know how good the U.S. and Israel is, and that's always an uphill battle. But our team played, as I think, as well as they could play. Um, and we we pushed the U.S. hard in our game with them, and we pushed Israel pretty hard. And we wound up beating Argentina for the bronze medal, which was really fun. So I realize this is goofy. I'm a 53-year-old guy talking like I'm an 11-year-old kid. Um, but all the guys on the team kind of feel the same way. Like, in fact, four of us on Sunday, I hope I'm not breaking any uh, – pandemic rules by saying this we were all distancing but four of us met up at a park not like a not like just a little you know school park and ran up and down a hill for half an hour on sunday to try to stay in shape this is what we do you know and we're all as my grandmother would say we're all mashuga so um so that, it, it's been great it's really wonderful it's not something like when i was in high school i was like an okay player that's it i wouldn't have been nearly good enough to play on an open team or anything like that but the, there's a saying in Masters, uh, you know, with each passing year, it's less and less about what you used to be and more and more about what you are. And I'm not much. I'm just trying to deteriorate a little bit more slowly than people my age. So um, it's been a lot of fun and I met some great guys through the experience. You've also had some great coaches at the games. I believe Digger Phelps and John Doerr were two of them. So yes. tell me about that. So Digger was our coach in 2000. And well, I don't want to leave out Alon Bross. Alon Bross was our coach in 2011. Sorry, Alon. Yeah, in uh, in Brazil, uh, Digger Phelps was our coach in Israel in 2013. That was when I broke my foot. So um, I, I play. We had a we had a hard three day training camp, which was great. Actually, that was my favorite part because I played. Training camp was great. Uh, we did not play well in in that uh, in 2013. Um, Digger's a he's tough he's a tough guy. And, and after I broke my foot, I became like the assistant coach slash scorekeeper and foul keeper. Uh, and I still got yelled at and I wasn't even playing. So, but Digger was great. I've known him forever. Uh, and John Doerr, who uh, before I ever became involved with this, from what I understand, coached uh, Maccabi before, uh, he was terrific. We, we had a great time with John. Uh, he got to know us very well. He knew some of the guys who had been around forever. He knew them for probably 20 years, I think. Um, and he, he was great with us. He, we didn't have a lot of guys. We only brought nine guys and we had some injuries while we were there and he got the most out of all of us. So that was, again, uh, the 2017 was, was the most, uh, the most fun that I've had. And speaking about incredible coaches, you also coached your son at a JCC in Maccabi game. Mm -hmm. 
Where does that fit into your list of accomplishments? Um, I wouldn't call it a, uh, an accomplishment, but I would say it was a very rewarding experience. I, I, my son, Ben, who's 19, played baseball for a ton of years. And, and I was uh, an assistant coach, actually, on a JCC Maccabi team with some great coaches. And we went down to Michigan. I, I'm trying, I don't remember what year this would be, maybe 2014, something like that. And we played against teams from New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, kind of the Northeast and, and the Midwest, and had just an unbelievable experience. It was great. It was great for the kids. Um, and, and I, I, I get all, uh, I, I love this, you know, meeting people from other countries, other cities, whether it's a Maccabi, a JCC Maccabi, whatever the case may be. And our kids played great. We were the, we were underdogs. You know, first of all, we were the only Canadian team there, and this is baseball. We're playing against Americans in the U.S., and I think a lot of them expected that they would just roll over us, and our kids played really well, like just about as well as they could play it, and we wound up winning the silver medal. Lost to a great team. Uh, I think they were from Chicago, if I'm remembering right, in the championship game. Uh, but again, it was a phenomenal experience, you know, and, and it's uh, – as as a dad, to be able to coach my son in baseball, I coached Ben for about seven years, and then coached him uh, at JCC Maccabi as well. Was uh, was you know something? If they're in, you know who, whatever other dads are on this right now, they they know what I'm talking about. It's it's something you never forget. And speaking about a 21st century father son activity, will you be restarting your podcast with your son? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure right now. Um, uh, did a podcast a couple of years ago and Ben was a, uh, kind of a supporting actor. He was in it from, from time to time. Um, he's now at Syracuse, although he's back, you know, he's back home because of the coronavirus, but he's away at Syracuse. So it's a little bit harder. And, and truthfully, Ritter, um, the, the podcast I did, I didn't think I could do it again that way. Um, uh, you know, all the, the people who were nice enough to do interviews with me, like I called in every favor and cashed in every chip that I had. And Sportsnet and I have talked about the possibility of doing uh, another podcast, but it would be in a different form. I don't know exactly what it would be, uh, but I'd like to I'd like to do something in, in the future. So, uh, But right now, kind of focusing uh, during the summer uh, on just doing the Blue Jay games on TV. So because you're doing Blue Jay games, you're seeing a lot of young talent coming up. I grew up watching Vlad Guerrero. What do you think about Vlad Guerrero Jr. and, of course, the future of the Jays? So uh, Jr.'s got as much hitting ability as, as just about anybody you'll ever see. Uh, he found out last year the major leagues is pretty, pretty hard, pretty challenging. And I would never say his year was a disappointment, uh, but I would say the numbers didn't quite get to where people thought they would get, especially after we'd seen guys like Ronald Acuna with Atlanta and Juan Soto with Washington come up and put up sensational numbers. We kind of expected the same from Vlad. I thought coming into this year, he would be way better. Um, you know, he admitted he needed to be in better shape. He admitted he became fatigued in September. Um, you know, they, they get a scouting report on you pretty quickly up at the big leagues. I think he's going to be a great hitter. I really do. I'm not sure. I, I've heard a lot of people think he's going to be a 50 home run guy. I'm not sure he's going to be that. I think he'll be a 30, 35 home run guy and hit for a great average, have a good eye, good on base percentage, great slugging percentage. Uh, and be one of the better offensive players in, in baseball. Um, you know, he apparently, I never got down to Dunedin before uh, everything was shut down because I was still doing college basketball, so I didn't see him in person this year. He apparently looked better, was in better shape. Like, it wasn't like he lost 25 pounds or anything in the offseason, but he apparently looked better. And, and I think that's important to get him through a 162-game season whenever we get to the point where we can dream of a 162-game season. So, you know, there are still some questions. Can he stay at third? Do they move him to first? Does he become a DH? They're going to give him every chance to play at third. And I think he'll be much better whenever baseball resumes again. Uh, and I think having Bo Bichette along for the whole season will be huge for him. I'm an enormous Bo Bichette fan. I think Bo's going to be a stud, a star, an all-star, maybe a batting champion, the whole deal. And I like Guriel and Biggio a lot, too. These are four really, really interesting young players the Blue Jays have for the next however many years. Fantastic. Obviously, they play different positions. They're different builds. But when it's all said and done, how do you think Vlad Jr. is going to compare to his father? Well, Sr. is a Hall of Famer. <laughs> so, Jr. Of can have a great, an expo. Yeah, yeah. Jr., Jr. can have a great career. Great career. And maybe still not be as good as his dad. 
Uh, it's it's too soon to say. It really is. You know, his dad, as you know, and and I watched him a lot, loved him. He was a, I, I mean, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer too, right? He got in on. He's a special, special player, um, and a very different player, as you say, different body type, different position, unbelievable throwing arm, way different hitter. You know, swung at everything. Whereas Junior is much more disciplined. So, um, I think I think it's hard to say. Like uh, I hope. I hope Junior doesn't spend too many years getting compared to Senior. Let's just let him be the best Vlad Junior that he can be, and and I think he's going to have, uh, you know, I think if he's if he's serious about being the best that he can be, which I I hope and think he is, I think he'll have a great career. So this one comes just from me. What are your thoughts on the return of baseball to Montreal and this interesting yet crazy idea of half season Montreal, half season Tampa? I think baseball is going to return to Montreal. I don't think it's going to happen in the next few years. Uh, I keep looking at Tampa and their lease is up in 2027. And I keep thinking the Expos will be in Montreal in 2028. Tampa's been a, a great uh, franchise on the field with you know very, very little money behind them. They don't draw well. They got a bad ballpark. It's in the wrong part of town, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't. I don't love the plan of the split season. I don't think it makes sense unless it's temporary, like a stepping stone towards the team eventually fully moving to Montreal. But I, I think the Expos are coming. I think it's coming, I hope, in 2028. No disrespect to Tampa, but whether it's expansion or Tampa leaving, I think Montreal is going to get a team in, around 2028, and I hope they're in the Blue Jays division. It would be really cool to have that rivalry. What do you think went wrong with Tampa? They went to a World Series. They've been contention. They've made the playoffs. Non-UN team. Well, uh, there's no evidence that Major League Baseball works in Florida. Um, the Marlins have not drawn well, and the Rays have not drawn well. And again, they've got a bad ballpark. It's in the wrong spot. And I think their fans now are conditioned to expecting to lose their best players each and every year. But I just don't know that there are enough Major League Baseball fans in the state of Florida. Uh, even when they're really good in August and September, they're only getting 15,000, 18,000. You know, you go down there for a Yankee game or a Red Sox game, and it's two-thirds Yankees and Red Sox fans. So um, the ballpark is an issue, but I'm not sure there's any evidence to suggest there's enough of a fan base there. So they have a terrible ballpark. Montreal has an awful one. What's the best one you've been to? Well, Montreal would eventually have to get a new one if the team comes back. They could play out of the big O for a year or two, maybe. But um, so this this is a question I get asked fairly frequently, actually. Uh, Wrigley Field, Fenway Park have to go in a whole separate category because of the history of the two parks. They're both special, and they really, really are special. Um, other than that, I would say I think it's now called Pac Bell. It's been AT and T. I can't remember. Uh, San, San Fran, the, the, the Giants Park. Yeah, the Giants Park is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the Pirates Ballpark is absolutely gorgeous. And then after that, I would say like San Diego and Seattle are probably my favorites. You know, it's funny. The first one that changed everything was Camden Yards in Baltimore when they built it, I believe, in 1992, I think. And it's still great. It really is with the warehouse out beyond the right field fence. And it, it just looks like a ballpark. I'm a fan, no disrespect to Rogers Center. I'm a fan of ballparks more than stadiums. and smaller, intimate, warmer colors. Uh, th that's what does it for, for me. So uh, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, San Diego, Seattle would probably be my top four. And your favorite city to visit on the road? Ooh. San Francisco is great. Um, I could go San Francisco again. You know what? I, I love Boston. I really, Chicago's great too. Like I've been very lucky. There, there are a lot of great cities. I know my way around Boston very well. I do a ton of walking in Boston. Um, Boston's pretty. Boston's pretty special, actually. If I if I had to pick one, uh, I like the energy there. I like how much I can walk. I know where everything is. I love New York, but man, it's uh, the, 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 okay. Here comes here comes the complaining of somebody who travels all the time. The flight's always delayed. You can't get a cab. It takes an hour and a half to get into town, all that kind of stuff. I've got some travel fatigue in, in, in me after traveling as much. So um, I, I like cities you can get into a little bit easier. Boston's a little bit easier. Fair enough. So you're around ball players all the time. They're known for their superstitions. What are yours? 
I honestly don't know if I have any superstitions. I, I, I you mean as a broadcaster? Like, do I do anything the same way all to the get time? ready for a game? Get ready for the World Series game seven. I I I don't think I'm superstitious. Um, I mean, if uh, that's a good question, I've never been asked that question before. I don't think I'm superstitious at all. Uh, I I don't I don't think I. You know, it's not like I wear the same tie if I had a good broadcast the week before or something like that. So I kind of prepare the same way all the time. It's more routine than than superstition. But um, you know, as my as my sons will tell you, their annoying old dad just keeps saying, "You can only control two things: your your level of preparation and your attitude." So I, I kind of put my energy into those two. Fantastic. Brian wants to know if you had to pick one game to broadcast, which would you choose? The World Series, Super Bowl, or Game 7 in the Stanley Cup Finals? That's a good question. So I've done the World Series, albeit on radio, not on TV, but I've done Game 7s of World Series, and they are they are pretty special. Um, I think of those three, because I've done the World Series, I would look at one of the other two. I think it would be Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals, to be honest with you. So, I mean, a Super Bowl would be awesome. But... Uh, the, the tension and the drama in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final, especially if the game were to go to overtime, uh, you know, that, that would be something else. And, and I'm still a Leaf fan, you know, because I don't work on hockey. I think it's totally fair for me to say, yeah, I like the Leafs. I root for the Leafs. So um, I don't know if I'll ever, you know, do hockey going forward or not. But, I, but I, doing, doing a Stanley Cup Final would be, would be something else. Well, we also don't know if the Leafs will ever be in the Stanley Cup Finals. Hey. You know, uh, I was going to make a Montreal Canadiens joke, but I'm too nice to do that. <laughs> How many Montreal Canadiens fans does it take to unscrew a light bulb? I'm not going to dignify that with a response. You know, I can't even answer? <laughs> <laughs> it takes five. One to unscrew the light bulb and four to tell you how good the old light bulb used to be. <laughs> That's literally the only joke I know, too. It's the only joke I ever tell. It's but it, it's, Leaf, Leaf fans can't really be throwing stones. So because the last year the Leafs won the cup, uh, I was in diapers. So it's it, it's been a while. You, you guys have had some more recent ones than, than the Leafs have had. Not recent, recent, but more recently the Leafs have had. But I would I would love to see the Leafs hoist the Stanley Cup at some point uh, it, while I'm around still. I'm sure many people on this uh, conversation would love <laughs> to see that as well. Yeah. We actually had an interesting question uh, about women's hockey. So uh, who would be your favorite women's hockey player to uh, interview or uh, spend time with? I, I am not uh, uh, very involved in, in women's hockey. I don't know. I, I respect it like crazy. And the Canada-U.S. games are incredibly competitive and intense. But for me to, you know, to pick somebody out, I, I, I wouldn't have the expertise to, to do that. But um, I am... I am thrilled with how, and I see it down in the U.S. with women's college basketball too, whether it's the WNBA, uh, international women's hockey, women's college basketball. You know, I'm thrilled at how far these sports have come in, in the last 20, 30 years, how much more attention they get, uh, how much more of a following, the ratings. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. And, you know, sometimes uh, a lot of our female athletes, a lot of times, a lot of our female athletes don't get the attention they deserve unless we see them in an Olympic setting, whether it's hockey in the winter or whatever, swimming, gymnastics, track and field uh, in the summer. And that's a shame because uh, they're just as talented and just as hardworking as the male athletes. So I, I hope they continue to get more and more attention. Of course, as do we all. Um, interesting question. Did you ever uh, have Kevin Pilar over Rosh Hashanah dinner? No, I did not. I, <laughs> I did not have Kevin Pillar over for Rosh Hashanah dinner. I did not have Sean Green over for Rosh Hashanah dinner. So, um, but it is funny uh, when I mean there are a few Jewish broadcasters. Mike Wilner, of course, is um, is Jewish. Shai Davidi is Jewish. So there are a few of us around the ballpark. And when Kevin was here, uh, you know, there would be you know the odd inside joke. Um, Mike and Shai and myself are all more Jewish, I think, than Kevin is. Um, but but Kevin is Jewish. You know, there were some conversations that would kind of, uh, you know, be outside of his interest or or, or whatever the case may be. But um, yeah, it, it did give you a, a bit of an introductory uh, angle with a ball player when that happens. It doesn't happen often. So, um, but I, I had a great relationship with Kevin when he was here. Uh, and, 
he's he's a funny guy, an interesting guy, and and you know the fact that we were both Jewish gave us a little bit extra to talk about every now and again. Awesome. So you know, I'll just uh, let you out, let you go out to your evening because it's been an incredible conversation. So I'll close it by asking if you have anything to add, anything you want to say to the Maccabi community, the JCC community. Uh, I just want to thank the Maccabi community for uh, welcoming me over the past uh, however many, eight, ten years, however many years it's been. And whether it was in Brazil or in Israel, you know, met so many nice people who worked so hard behind the scenes. And I know a bit of a setback for everybody to have to push the games back to uh, 2022. Um, but, you know, God willing, everybody will be healthy and the games will happen in 2022. And, and uh, you know, if there are younger Maccabi athletes on the call, uh, make the most of your time during this during this time. Come out of this better than you than you than you went into it. And uh, wishing everybody the best. And I, I think the the JCC is involved in this as well. Uh, and I literally grew up at the JCC. Was there constantly at the, at the one at Bathurst and Shepherd. The old, you know, it was the Y back then. It wasn't even the JCC. We played a ton of floor hockey, swimming lessons, basketball, all that kind of stuff. So. You know, just to um, everybody in the Jewish community who's watching, I, I'm proud to be a, a part of the community. And, uh, you know, it, it's I'm Toronto, born and raised, went to Bialik, have lived here my whole life and, you know, enjoy seeing people uh, out in the community, enjoy being a part of the community. And, and just want to thank you guys for having me on tonight. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we hope you stay healthy and safe. And uh, can't wait to uh, see you on ESPN and hear you on the radio in uh, the summer. Uh, I, I hope so. Hope we get some baseball games before long. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, everybody.